So um, I'm uh, now a professor, I was promoted last year, I'm a professor of statistical literacy at the University of Manchester. Um, but I've, I've, this is about my third career, I started off in a teaching career and I've moved into a, a career in higher education. Um, and it will become apparent through the course of my talk uh, who I am and what I do. And I guess I'm coming at it very much from the this talk, in any case, from um, looking at the skill set at the undergraduate level and how we can develop that in the undergraduate curriculum so that we can produce the sorts of graduates that we've been to hearing about today. And I've entitled my talk, it's a, a talk based on a talk I gave out in Melbourne, the Australian National University and Queensland University last year by invitation because they're also grappling with this space about how do we produce quantitative graduates. <coughs> uh, so I, I based it on this title because we're very much of the opinion that statistics is a practical skill set. Sure, it's based on theory and sure it helps to understand where some of the, um, the theory comes from and how it feeds into the statistical analysis. But we have taken the approach, it's a very applied skill, and you'll see what we've done with that and what our approach is. So that's me, I represent the University of Manchester Q-Step Centre, but I'm also the business engagement lead for the School of Social Science, I'm the employability lead, and I sit on various university level committees looking at data and digital science. So I'm there, I think, representing the social scientists in the room, because it's becoming very apparent that a lot of the data science has been driven by the computer scientists, and we've all heard today what the value of a social scientist is. So I've just written down a quote that I use with my students a lot, some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well informed just to be undecided about them. And I guess that's you know, really what we all bring to the table, but particularly social sciences because of the complexity of social processes. Right, I have a lot of slides and I'm going to rush through them. I talk fairly quick, but please, I will circulate these slides subsequently so you do have access to them. So I sit within the University of Manchester and I'm part of all those different groups and anybody who knows anything about the University of Manchester will know that we are known for quantitative social science. We have a history in that space and it's largely because of Cathy Marsh, whose picture is on that slide, who set up and was very passionate about using data in the social sciences and her legacy lives on through those of us who work there. And I sit in the social statistics division of the social sciences department. Okay, I look for, um, I'm, I'm very pro getting women into, into data science as well, so, you know, I call out all male panels and I make no apology for doing that, but I'm very um, keen to get more women at undergraduate level doing data social science or social data science, and so I put that picture up to show that, you know, this is a, an amalgamation of a lot of different skill sets that we've heard about today, and hey, women can do it too, right? Don't be deceived that they can't. Um, and we have a new program at the University of Manchester that's funded by the SRC and run with other northern universities called Data Analytics and Society. So here's an opportunity to plug that program because uh, some of the graduates and postgraduates will be coming into the labour market having gone through a 1 plus 3, a Masters plus PhD program where they've done some advanced quantitative methods at postgraduate level and as part of that training, they've done a work placement in an organisation that's willing to collaborate with the university where the programme is based. So this is very sort of hot off the press. That programme has only taken its first intake, I think, this year. There are other universities providing similar programmes. But, you know, this is the, the place to be. And the students are queuing up to get onto these courses because they recognise the employability nature and the opportunity to have real-world experience whilst they're doing their postgraduate qualification. So our approach to work-based learning is very much, as I said, based on uh, previously the Cobb's learning cycle about understanding the theory and then developing the practice and then reflecting on the practice. And essentially what we're doing at Manchester in line with all the other Q-step centres is trying to make numbers a normal part of the social science curriculum, get more students doing numerical analysis earlier. So one of the first things I go into my first year sociology class and do is put a number on the screen and ask them if it's a big number. You know, a billion, is that a big number? And get them to talk about, is that a big number? Is it small? If you divide by the population of the UK, what does that mean in terms of, you know, expenditure on the NHS and so on? So get them realising this isn't some sort of mystical thing that they've forgotten how to do because they didn't do it in, since they were 16 at school. But this is stuff that just enables them to analytically 
look at numbers in a way that makes sense to the subject that they're studying. So we're not going and teaching them a whole load of formula. We're asking them about if they've come to study politics or sociology or criminology or whatever they have, they've got to put number as a part of that skill set that they're developing as a graduate. Because A, hey, that's a good thing to do, and B, the labour market requires it. So we make them do that. They no getting out of that. They it used to be optional, now we make it compulsory. All students have to do that in their first year. Um, and you would be surprised, or maybe not, how hard it is for students to read a graph or a table. Okay, anybody who teaches this stuff, a two-way cross-tabulation, oh my goodness, the time you spend on that, Patrick, yeah? In terms of getting people to read down the columns across the rows or whatever. And so we start right back at the basics. And you have to, because you have to develop the confidence to give the students the ability to go on and do the more complex analysis that we've been hearing about. So we introduce courses in year one. All social science students at Manchester have to do a course, criminology, politics, making sense of politics there. And then we build on that in year two and we make it more applied. So they've had the foundation laid. And then in year two, there is a selection of courses which they can take. If they're doing a quantitative methods pathway through their degree, these are compulsory. If they're not, if they're just doing a general social science degree or sociology, they can opt into these or out of them. So we don't make these compulsory, but we do make sure they all have access to some basic training in the first year. And these are specific to the discipline, okay? So I can't overstate enough how we're not teaching statistics. This isn't a maths or statistics course. This is about embedding statistics into the discipline that they've come to university to study. And we've written papers on that. So it's substantively led. Everything we do is about the, uh, the politics of uh, social systems or sociology and, and, and differences and so on, both... Uh, National and global, we look at lots of different sorts of data, or criminology. Um, and we invite speakers in from outside. I've just had my um, reflections back from my students from a market research course. Never taught market research before, but I decided what to do is to get some people in who are professionals in market research. Students love it. Okay, so we've got somebody in to do a focus group, we've got somebody else in to do some geodemographic profiling. Absolutely love it, because they can see that there's a relevance to what they're learning in the classroom to um, the workplace that they might enter afterwards. So we do lots of work with external organisations and that becomes important because of what I'm going to say next. And we start with descriptive and go all the way up to regression. Okay? And at master's level they, they go beyond and do more advanced um, statistical analyses. But we mostly, bear, we mostly look at bivariate analyses at the undergraduate level. The smart ones, they as a result of having done the work placement come back and want to do more advanced stuff in the third year and we can support that. And SPSS and R tend to be the two software packages that we focus on. There is some state to use, but predominantly the SPSS and R. Okay, the internships which I'm about to talk to you about, um, they are eight weeks long. We've been running this program for four years now. We pay the students at living wage and we do that because we have the grant from the QSTEP funders, Nuffield, ESRC and HFC. I'm sure John talked about Nuffield and QSTEP. So we contribute £1,000 per student from the grant to um, the internship, but the university tops it up by £1,800 currently. So the university is investing in this programme because they see the benefit of it in terms of employability and skills development and the reputation of Manchester. Because we proved the case, not just because they thought it was a good thing to do. Um, and they go, go all over. So Manchester, London predominantly. We've had um, our interns go to Sheffield, Glasgow, Liverpool last year, Washington, D.C. And next year, they'll be going to Melbourne as well. Back to Washington, D.C. and Melbourne. So we're making it international. Uh, and they're competitive, and we do train. I can talk much more about that, but I won't. Now, this slide is out of date. We've got three years' worth of data there. We've now got 2017s, which we've not had time to add. And I know you can't see at the back because I was um, looking earlier, but the most popular... Uh, so these are the degrees on the bottom. I've lost my button, so... Okay. So the degrees on the bottom show that the most popular courses or degree courses our students are doing, that they go on to do internships, are criminology or law, and then politics and IR, PPE, or a general social science or sociology degree. So we have linguistics as part of our mix at the University of Manchester, but for reasons of lack of continuity of staff, we haven't really developed that 
as much as we would have liked to have done, which is interesting because a lot of the stuff here today has been about textual analysis and linguistics. So you can see how it's grown in each year. This politics and IR spike in 2016, we believe was because the course was made compulsory in the first year. So all of the students that came through to the second year here had had the basic training to give them confidence, and we've got qualitative interviews to say that, to actually put themselves forward to do one of these internships. Right, so they're data-driven research-led. It's all they have to be. Data-driven, they've got to have quantitative data somewhere in the mix, and they have to be a real, uh, real piece of research. Okay, so this isn't made up, or just giving you somebody for your team um, to make the coffee, as Joe Twyman would say. This is a real piece of research that matters to somebody. And it's designed by the host organization, not us, and we have borrowed from the UCL model that you heard about earlier from Guy, in terms of taking uh, the master's program that you develop, but this isn't assessed, this doesn't lead to a qualification. And there's all the organizations that we've worked with over the last three or four years, predominantly public sector, um, private sector is always a challenge because for eight weeks it's really hard for them to commit in advance to a piece of work that a student would be able to do and give them a supervisor who would be willing to sort of take them under their wing for eight, eight weeks. And we understand that because of the nature of sort of private versus public work. But it's a fairly impressive set of logos on that slide. And the students, as you can imagine, second years are coming away with something to put on their C CV to say who they've worked with and what they've done. We celebrate, we don't assess, I've already said that, so we require them to now produce three reflective pieces, so we're using reflection as a way of sort of monitoring how this goes. They all have to produce a poster, end of, they all have to do that, and then we have a conference in November, which John usually comes to, thank you, and others, and we um, celebrate their successes by getting them to stand by their posters and talk about what they did, but also 10 of them get the opportunity to present their work in three minutes. Right, so you'd be hard pressed to get an academic to present any piece of work in three minutes, but the students do an amazing job and it all comes down to the graphical representation of what they do. And that's an example of a poster. And we put all of those on the website, anybody can see those. Okay, so what do the students get out of it? What do the organisations? Well, here's a selection of the sorts of things that our students have done. Remember, these are second year students. Mostly, they come straight from college into university. Um, we have a think tank in the north called IPPR North. It's part of the IPPR setup. For the last three years running, our QSTEP interns have produced um, a contribution to those reports that then go out to State of the North report in September, October. Um, one of them unearthed a, a statistic about the 10 point gap between primary school children in London and the South East compared to the North. So students, uh, primary school students are already disadvantaged by the time they get to what used to be junior school because of that gap that's opened up. One of our students uncovered that and it hit the national press and got a lot of coverage on it. We have students writing um, blogs, we've got students who have come back and been named on academic papers because they've done the grunt work of the analysis that's then been written up. Um, and we've got students working in the media, writing news reports for things like Red Box. We then also, remember we don't assess, we, we uh, reward, we have a set of prizes that we give out for the best quantitative dissertation that gets supported by QSTEP funds. Not a lot, £50. Pounds but that's something, again, these students can put on their CVs. And we have fantastic working relationships with the organisations that I put on my previous slide. So much so that we're developing postgraduate and postdoc opportunities for uh, our students who haven't necessarily come through QSTEP, but have the attributes and skills in order to be able to do quantitative work in those different sectors. Um, yeah, and we keep in touch with them. Uh, we've done lots of interviews, we've got a Facebook closed group where I reach out to them and ask them what they're doing now, and they give me lots of feedback. And we've developed some short films where the students promote for themselves, for other students as well, how well it's gone for them. So Natasha would never have touched a number with a barge pole, but she's now working in a big data analytics company because of the key step placement that she did, and she's there on that slide. And of course, because we're academics, we're publishing on this as well. So that paper just gives um, three case studies of three students who did a sociology course and then we've taken 
uh, we've taken interviews from them to show how that's developed their own skill set. One of which is now just about finishing his PhD in social stats. Oh, and I'm writing a book on this as well. So, um, you can't see this, but I just want to show you that we do collect feedback from the students. So, Jojo has just finished her master's program in social research methods and statistics at Manchester. She wouldn't have done it if she hadn't have had the opportunity to do QCEP, if she didn't know what it was all about. Politics and international relations. Um, and I use this at the Festival of Social Science event because I'm one of the students who came to that event to see that they didn't have to have maths or statistics to be able to become like these students. So this student had politics, history and economics. That one had English history and theology. You know, and they went on and did a few step placement. <coughs> um, Sophie did a fantastic piece of work. Every year we do some work with the university's office that looks at planning, um, the planning support office. And they were looking at differential offer rates to students from different educational backgrounds, whether they came from private school, uh, independent school, or um, non-private school. And she was very driven by social mobility. And so she was substantively interested in the area of work she was doing and did a fantastic piece of work for the university, which has got onto the vice chancellor's desk. You know, so there's all sorts of outlets for this. Uh, she was a sociology student, English sociology and RE. And then Hannah. Okay, so Hannah is now working at the Crime Office. So Hannah came in as a criminology student, did a, an internship there with them, paid internship, then went off and got a master's, and then applied for one of the, I think it was their GSS, Government Statistician uh, Pathways, and he's now working at the Home Office. Um, and she did have maths and stats in her background. Uh, I don't know where that's gone. Yeah. Sorry, wrong button. Uh, Jess is interesting because he went to YouGov, so we have good, strong connections with YouGov. And I put this quote up because he said, I'm one of the only graduates on the scheme that he's now in. He's a data consultant for an IT consultancy. I'm one of the only graduates on that scheme that doesn't have a background in maths, computer science, or economics. And I think that sums up, actually, that most organizations seem to be looking for the computer scientists and mathematicians but hey, we've got this whole cohort of students that are developing with that skill set as well. Right, nearly finished. So um, I'm very enthusiastic about this. That will take you not by surprise. But what I try to do is get the students involved because they are you know, the future students who will be our alumni who will come back and talk. So last October, I went up to Glasgow. Um, I spoke at the Royal Statistical Society Conference and got four QSEP alumni, not from Manchester, but from all of the four nations, to come and talk about what they've done. So we had Edinburgh, Queen's University, Belfast, Cardiff, and Manchester. Students talking about what they've done. And you know, it was a showstopper. People in the room were just agog with the sorts of things they've done. And then the very next day, my student, Anna, ex-student, she was the one who nearly got away because we didn't place her initially because it just wasn't a good fit. She sends me this on my Facebook page from Canada. She's two years out of university. She's doing research for the organization that's London-based, a place called AudienceNet, does lots of market research, loads of visualization. She went off to uh, Canada um, to a delegate meeting where she got to present her research and meet with um, the president. Okay, which, you know, okay, that's sort of the, the creme de la creme, if you like, but the sorts of opportunities that this program is opening up to our uh, students is just phenomenal. And the organisation she's gone to were paying for her to do a master's at LSE, which she's now currently doing. Uh, it will be obvious that what we're doing at undergraduate level across all the QSTEP centres is developing a pipeline to research. Um, and the research pipeline is opening up in terms of data analytic programmes. And that's really what we're here to talk about today as much as working with, with industry. Um, and I mentioned postdoc opportunities. So because we often get organizations coming to us and saying, do you have a student who could do? And they give us a, a, an abstract about the sort of work they can do. You know, we don't always have a student at undergraduate level who can do the type of work they've got, which could be sophisticated data analysis or statistical modeling. But never want to miss an opportunity. What we try to do is find funding or collaborate with the organization to find funding. So Patricio from Corso, um, from Chile, did his PhD about the Chilean education system and he used a technique called multi-level modeling. 
The Department of Education came to us and said, we've got this vast six year long data set, we don't know how to analyse it, do you have anybody? And I said, well yes, but we can't give that to an undergraduate, that's far too complex. But hey, we've got somebody who's got these skills, let's try and find. So we put a bid and got some money. Um, he went off for six months and did a secondment with the DfE. Oh my goodness, working with government departments, you can't even get, you can't get the data off site, never mind the software or anything else, but heck, we jumped through all those hoops and barriers. And he produced for the minister a report that is now on the website. So that's an example from government sectors, if you like, but there's no reason why that couldn't be done for uh, the private sector or um, the third sector. Maybe just a minute more for some Sure. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that we're already consulting with visitors. So we've already, because we've got these connections, started to talk to our employer host organisations about what they say they need in a graduate employer. So there is a perception of needs. It's not always quite much with what they actually do do when they get there. Um, and we're starting to develop that into a research proposal. So I think you know, it's natural that we, yeah. we continue to talk. And I'll sum up by just saying that's my contact details. Very happy to talk to anybody today or subsequently. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a, thank you. Right. So do we?